Coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Welcome back to the Eye on College Basketball podcast. This is a one-of-a-kind episode. I am Matt Norlander, and if you are watching here on YouTube, you see a man that I cannot believe that we have on the show right now. That is Jeff Ament from Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam's got a new record coming out in April, and in fact, CBS is actually going to be using some some of the some of the Pearl Jam music from Dark Matter, the new record coming April 18th, I believe is the date there, Jeff. You can correct me if I'm uh, if I'm off on that. But he's also a huge hoops fan, has relationships with college coaches. Um, <laughs> it is an absolute joy. And this is a life achievement for me, Jeff, uh, to be able to check this box off. I appreciate you giving some time. And not only that, giving some time on Selection Sunday. How are you doing? Uh, well, I mean, this is the, you know, arguably one of the greatest days you know, of the year in basketball. Um I mean, Thursday and Friday are the, are the, are the days, um, uh, you know, those, you know, the, those are the days that um, you, you do whatever it takes to, to be at home and, and not doing much. So um, <laughs> I'd like to be here talking to an expert. Well, I appreciate that. Um, we are going to actually get <laughs> Jeff's bracket picks before the end of the show, but I've got a lot of hoops Pearl Jam talk to get into here. Um, genuinely, Pearl Jam is one of my five favorite bands, and I have been a fan for a long time. My uncle, when I was 10... Actually, Quince, I was born in 81. In 91, he sent me 10, uh, but I didn't know what it was. And I didn't actually listen to it for the first time until I think like 93. And then wow. it really started to click. Wow. Um, I am probably an obnoxious PJ fan and that Yield is my favorite record. Uh, yeah. I think No Way is my favorite Pearl Jam song. So you guys almost never play that in concert, right? That's a rarity, <clears throat> isn't it? Yeah, I th I, we probably played it 10 times. I think there's, you know uh that that's that i mean i i don't know if we played it since i remember we played it at pj20 yes that's kind of the last time i remember and we have worked on it a few times backstage but um yeah that's a good one that's like that might be my favorite stone gossard track of all times oh i love to hear that man yeah no way is uh, the most underrated pearl jam song in the catalog <laughs> as far as i'm concerned and i am yes i'm a i'm a huge huge yield fan yield versus yeah, 10's obviously up there. I think Riot Act's probably your most underrated record of them wow. all. Um, nice. I, I really, really, really like that. Uh, but let's get into, uh, I want to uh, touch on a few things. One, you've got a lot of connections in basketball in general. So for the audience that might not realize this, um, lifelong sports fan, but what are your connections to college pro basketball? Obviously from the Seattle area, but you have Montana ties. So you're not just on here because PJ's got a new record coming out. You genuinely love hoop. And so, uh, yeah, what, uh, where did that start and, and who in the game are you still uh, involved with and friends with? Um, well, I, I mean, it was, the, it was probably my first love, uh, getting a basketball for my fifth, uh, birthday, um, and growing up in a small town, um, you know, uh, it was, it was what I did when I had time to myself and, uh, I, I played, I actively played with, uh, guys until four or five years ago. Um, I'm 61. So. I have, I have basically zero cartilage in my lateral side of my left knee, my jumping, my jumping leg. Um, but uh, I, man, I love it. I uh, half of my best friends uh, I met, I've met in a basketball court, um, you know, and, and some of those folks that, you know, include Larry Skowiak and Wayne Tinkle, um, the Snyders, Quinn Snyder and his brother, Matt. Um, so, uh, um, you know, there's nothing more exciting than, you know, a small town Montana kid, you know, putting on laced up the high tops and, and playing with your heroes. So, um, yeah, I love that, it. I love it. that's uh, this big time stuff. I was talking with Gonzaga coach Mark Few last summer, and apparently, I think you guys did some sort of charity thing on someone's house near a lake or whatever. But he, I was, I coincidentally, I was, I was texting him, and he was like, Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to see like Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam perform. And I was like, oh, cool. What, what spot? He's like, no, it's a private thing. It's like at someone's house or whatever. I don't know if you recall. I mean, the gigs probably yeah. like flow together, but it was, uh, maybe you remember because there were basketball people there. I asked him actually to get pictures. Uh, he refused <laughs> to do so and he held it over my head. So, um, so just to further in, you know, enforce that, uh, yeah, you've got some big hoop size. Well, I mean, I mean, I, the Zags um, have struggled a little bit this year, but I, I mean, they have a, they have a tough, 
who do they play first round? They have they have, they have a tough first round match. McNeese. They have they have they have McNeese, and I yeah, will have you tough. be picking Nick. McNeese is a legitimately good. Yeah. Is a very very good major team. So yes, they have it up against them. Gonzaga, by the way, has made eight straight Sweet Sixteens. That's the longest active streak in the sport. Wow! Wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're no uh, they're no joke. Um, how often do you get these basketball guys? Asking for like, uh, you know, passes backstage for shows. And I assume you you might accommodate that because uh, the, the favor might return yeah. when it comes to basketball stuff. Yeah, it's the it's the greatest trade off in the world. Um, I mean, when, you know, if uh, if I get if I get in a pickle and uh, I need tickets and and if I've given uh, some tickets to those guys in the previous year or two, then it's a little easier to ask. So um, and, and, and it. It's happened a couple times this year with the NBA. Um, unfortunately, well, you know what? I might make it to Spokane on Thursday. I'm going to try because I'm okay. I'm actually on my way up to Montana right now. So um, it, it's a pretty good group of teams up there. I think San Diego State, who um, I've watched a little bit over the years. And uh, so what, who else is in that? St. Mary? Uh, I think that's going to be you'll have Auburn, Yale up there, Gonzaga, McNeese, and then Kansas, Samford. There's actually some decent upset potential. I was at St. Um, I was at Salt Lake City, or is that Salt Lake City? Gonzaga's in Salt Lake City. If you're going to Spokane, yeah. so Spokane is Auburn, San Yale, State. San Diego State, UAB. Um, St. Mary's, right? St. Mary's Grand Canyon and Bama yeah. Charleston. That's what it is. That's yeah, yeah. what it is. I was getting yeah. my wires crossed with the Zags there. They, uh, they aren't going to play local because they aren't a top four seed. But yeah. Um, yeah, have you ever actually curious on that? One, um, how many times have you have you actually gone to an NCAA tournament game and and uh, connected to a that? Bunch. If you've gone to a bunch, so you've gone to a bunch. Have you ever gone to a Final Four and actually experienced that as a fan? Yeah, I see. I went to um, uh, it would have been Arkansas. Was it Arkansas Duke? Well, way back oh, uh, Final Four, yeah, like ninety four. Yeah, 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 the year that Clinton went because it was. I mean, it was yeah. super. It was super hard to get in. Um, and um, and then I went to Syracuse. Kansas in, oh, in New Orleans in Kansas. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Um, and the, the first game, um, uh, Mark Packer, Billy Packer's son was a big mm -hmm. fan at that time. And, um, right before the game, he came up and he said, Hey, do you want to, uh, take my job at halftime? And I go, what's your job? And he goes, uh, I have to run and get Cokes for my dad. And so uh, you have to sit at a chair right at half court. So I got to sit, Oh. At half court, the whole second half of that game, I got to sit basically between Jim Nance and Billy Packer and just sort of peek, peek over their shoulder. And I got to watch that game. And it was, uh, you know, highlight. Dude, All -time dude you highlight. got to watch the Hakeem work block from half court. Exactly. Oh my gosh. New Grant Orleans Hill. Right. Grant Hill. No, Grant, no, Grant Hill was 90. Grant Hill would have been uh, 92. Syracuse, Kansas was 03. Yeah. New yeah. Orleans Superdome. And that was a, that was a, a classic, yeah. classic title game. That yeah. is, that yeah. is wild. What is um, on that note? I was actually going to ask it, it, top two or three memories associated with like going to basketball games, either great games or just kind of wild scenes. If they were in the nineties or, or in the two thousands, I'm sure you've been to dozens and dozens, but I don't know if that's obviously a standout memory college or pro or otherwise, you know, Sonics used to be, you know, in Seattle for so long until they took them out of there. But I wonder if there's a, any any other stories you could kind of share with us of your uh, of your travels to hoops games over the years? Well, that, that game that game in Charlotte, the the championship game would, would be one one of the top three. Um, uh, second would probably be Game Seven, Utah Sonics '96. Mm -hmm. uh, they finally got over the hump and um, and beat Utah to get in the in, uh, into the finals against the Bulls. Um, actually, you know what? The, my first great basketball. My number one basketball experience was seeing the Globetrotters in 1971 in Haver, Montana, and getting Geese Osby's autograph. Mm. That's my that's my ultimate. That that was like when it re when it really cemented that that was what I was like. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Like watching the Globetrotters entertain you know people. I mean, it was the middle of nowhere, Haver, Montana, like North Central Montana, like middle of nowhere. The fact that those guys came and played basketball for us, but they, I was like that they're having more fun than anybody on the planet. And that's what I want to do. And so I thought, I honestly thought for a couple of years that I somehow would be able to manifest myself into being a globetrotter. I'm not sure what I was yeah. thinking, but I was seven. So you've had a pretty, it's worked out pretty well for you, Jeff, but <laughs> uh, sometimes you'll talk to athletes. They wish they were movie stars, movie stars, yeah. wish they were athletes, yeah. musicians, yeah. wish they were athletes. 
I give you your life and your career and everything, <laughs> or let's say you get to be Gary Payton, Hall of Fame level player for Seattle. Like, which one are you? I, I'm not, you know, which one do you take? I give you one or the other. What you have or what, or, or star for <laughs> Seattle and make a finals, one of the greatest I mean, defenders of all time. I mean, I love GP and I love Sean Kemp. I love that era. Um, uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll stay where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's. I'm still I'm still doing it. I'm still. I know, that's crazy. That is crazy. Um, let's let's swerve into that real quick because I I have to. This isn't like oh okay he's on we gotta talk the music, dude. I I don't have the time tonight. I could talk to you for an hour and a half. You're like no chance in hell that's happening, Norlander. But I could talk to you for the music process forever. Um, what enables Pearl Jam to exist? I mean, you are you are rarity. It's not that you haven't had some lineup changes. You have, but the lineup that you've had going now. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it, it, it far outlasts any other phase of your career, right? And yeah. how do you make this happen for 30 plus years? And is there a secret to, you know, I know just because I'm having talking to some bands that have been around a while, one healthy thing is that these strong relationships, but you're not around each other a lot. You move to different parts of the country, you have families, and that actually helps so that when you get back together, yep. you have an appreciation for each other. Maybe the chemistry is there, the spark is there to continue to make music. Maybe that's the case in Pearl Jam, maybe it's not, but I am curious how like, you guys are still going and still able to produce stuff that feels vital and doesn't feel like, you know, it's just filler. It's just to, to do it, just to do it. What's your secret? Well, I, I think, it, I think you're right. I think the absence makes the heart grow fonder. Uh, I think that part of it is, is, has been critical. I think, um, and especially in the early days, like sort of, I don't know, I don't know how we decided, but there were just times when we just shut stuff down and we would take a break. And the fact that we did that um, in the mid '90s when stuff was crazy, um, I think, really helped us long term. Um, the other part is almost every time that we get back together within the first two or three days, there's like there's that magical thing that happens that only happens. I mean, we all make music with tons of other people and and have you know different experiences and wear different hats and make solo records and. Um, collaborate with lots of other people, but there's something that happens when we get together in a room within a couple of three days that that's like, whoa, that's that only that's the thing that only happens when we get together. And um, I think to a guy, um, he would, you know, everybody would say the same thing. And I think that's the thing that keeps you coming back to it, you know, and, and, and wanting to like, you know, I think we still feel like that we have our best record in us somewhere. Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, I'm sure athletes feel the same way, you know, but. I think on some level, yes, but there's also like, you know, like LeBron James is probably so maniacally devoted that he thinks he can still have his best season ever. And he's the rare athlete. Uh, but it's, it's more of like chasing the championship and, and maybe that's uh, that, that equates there. Um, it is, it is fascinating when it comes to writing songs, when it came to writing songs for dark matter and for this record, what is the band's process with that? Uh, I, I am someone, and it's funny, like I know the people that listen to the podcast for my basketball stuff, they might not even realize like how music obsessed I am. I am a, I'm a guitar player. I try and fake it on the drums. I uh, love that stuff. Um, I love uh, I love playing, uh, you know, a number of Pearl Jam songs. So I'm always interested to see like, okay, how did this come to be? Like I know Eddie wrote Better, Better Man when he was, when he was young, um, but something like Rear View Mirror, and and such a driving guitar riff like did, did that stuff come or did you have a bass line that was there first or just different ways of building songs is it different now with this record than what you might have done for no code or what you might have done for riot act or what you would have done for binaural has, has the process evolved or have do you have a certain method with most songs that it just it feels like a familiar piece of clay and you know how to mold it even if you know the result might be different um there's a process that seems to work or is it different yeah, I mean, I mean, we've we've sort of approached it almost every way possible. I mean, we've we've made what um, 11, 12 records, and um, it was well, funny enough on, on Dark Matter, we sort of almost went back to the way that we did it the first two or three records, where we didn't come in with um, complete ideas or demos. Um, I think uh, a couple of us had like two parters kind of in our head, but you might just show everybody one part or you just start playing a part and everybody would fall in and sort of give their two bits. Ed, Ed wrote almost all the lyrics sort of on the spot, um, which is like, 
I think he really likes to feel the magic of a song coming together and that idea coming out of the ether and and um and you know I, I think you know probably eight or nine of the 11 songs like you know most of the song was sort of there the first hour or two that we we started you know riffing on it so um uh i think we've been playing together long enough that we can do that and and in some ways it's more satisfying i think as a band because everybody's bringing their part to it and everybody's you know matt's matt's not playing you know to like a, a drum loop that you know me or Stone have laid down on our demo tape or whatever he's like he's he's interpreting the riff and everybody everybody's interpreting the riff or, or whatever we start with and so um, and, and that song dark matter that started with a matt cameron drum beat so um <laughs> um it's uh I think that's the best way. I think I think honestly that's how we've written to me the you know most satisfying songs. When I look back over the last 30 years, it sort of feels like the songs that I really have um a real deep love for, the ones that sort of did come together quickly in the room um out of nowhere. Um so that's that's pretty uh that's pretty tremendous. I'm gonna read the track list here for our audience, then I want uh, insights from you in terms of uh mm -hmm. what ones you might have had the most influence over or ones that might be uh you might have a stronger attachment to than others, even though I'm sure you love most of them. So the it's eleven songs and it's scared of fear, react, respond, wreckage, dark matter, won't tell, upper hand, waiting for Stevie, running, something special, got to give, and setting sun. So as the bass player in the band. Um, yeah, which uh, which two or three of those kind of stand out to you most for whatever reasons that might be the case? Uh, well, I mean, there, there was a couple that, you know, started off, I think React Respond was sort of my bits and uh, uh, Won't Tell a Soul is like me playing a baritone guitar in that song. Um, and uh, Runnin was like originally called Big Sandy Punk, which is a town that I grew up in, Big Sandy. Um, and uh, when Ed came in after we'd been playing it, we'd been sort of arranging a version of it. Um, you know, he wrote, he wrote those lyrics, you know, like by four o'clock, we had a song. Um, and, and it was like, it's the most up-tempo song on the record. We kind of needed, we kind of needed it. So, um, but um, yeah, that's like three pretty different songs. Two of them are pretty up-tempo. One of them is kind of mid-tempo. Um, I really love like, I really love Waiting for Stevie. I really love uh, Gotta Give. I think the end of the record is really good. Got to give and setting sun, I think are two really beautiful songs. I think lyrically they're amazing. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, can't wait to, to get in a room with these guys and sort of, I mean, we're, we still have to sort of learn these songs again because we, we wrote these, most of these songs in a day. And so you only played them for a day and then, wow. And then you're on to the next thing. And then it's all of a sudden it's, you know, it's almost a year later. And, and so, you know, we still have to we still have to get in a room and really play these songs. How about that? How about, has has there been a record that that actually that process has been similar to, or is this kind of the first time you've actually like kind of dumped everything so close there and then kind of you know the process you you, you mix it and you you figure what what makes the cut and what doesn't, but you kind of left it be. Is this is this a new uh, adventure for you, or is this kind of repeating something with either uh, Gigaton or something else recently? Well, I mean, we we spent so we we you know it, it was really like hit it and move on on this record. I, I mean, the last record we had to do that a little bit with, but the last record we, we stewed on those songs for a long period of time, like because we made that record in our studio and in Seattle, and people sort of would come and go and add and edit and arrange, and so um, this record was kind of like live in the room you know five of us kind of facing off and kind of kind of making it happen but like i said like we you'd spend you know five or six hours on it and then maybe fix a couple bits ed would work on the vocals maybe there's some percussion some background vocals mike mccready would maybe craft a little bit more of a lead to go over the i mean there's lots of mike mccready on this record which is which is super cool um so uh um yeah so so it, you know it's I, I gotta next week I gotta sit down and I gotta make some notes and, and okay good deal um I, I uh I have two more music ones and then we'll get to the bracket one yeah. my first is when it comes to just like playing bass on some on some PJ tunes live 
what are the four or five that whether because it's challenging whether because uh, you feel a certain connection with the audience whether it's because you you know you had a, the bass part in a certain song i had such a, a powerful I, you know you got to have certain favorites um i'm just purely from a bass player's perspective what are give me a handful of tunes that you over the um, years that have kind of held up and you've that you've either neither gotten sick of them uh, ever or uh yeah they just they kind of stand out for one reason or another um <clears throat> i really love playing hail hail um yeah like it's a it's such a great stone gossard riff and i love i love what i came up with to sort of accentuate his bits i'm sort of he's where he's playing a lot i'm kind of holding it down and then he leaves a spot where he hits a chord and then i kind of move and it's kind of it kind of exemplifies how he and i play together um i mean as you know he and i are sort of the rhythm section with matt um uh what else uh um i, ha I have a soft spot for tremor christ too because it's yeah. it's uh it's really f fluid i never ever play it the same way um there's kind of a really loose form to it and um it's uh it's for lack of a better word it's fairly jammy um <laughs> um what else um that you know the last record i really um love playing playing quick escape um we, we only got to play that song maybe 20 times live but um what else even flow is really super hard it's yeah. a hard song for me to play it's up tempo i'm playing it on fretless there's lots of notes um it's uh there's there's a lot of room to sort of stretch in that song um so um I, you know, it's a lot of times it's the songs that are challenging where you have to really hyper focus and it's the songs that where you have the most freedom, you know, you, there's a lot of places that you can go with them. So um, I, I tend to I love playing black. I never get sick of playing black. Yeah. And, and it kind of plays it's it kind of plays itself like the crowd is always so responsive to that song. And it's such a, you know, it really, rep it really represents us in the early days and, you know, a song that Stone wrote, you know, transitionally. Do you, do you remember why or how the decision got made to start Black when it's, you know, you've kind of got that lo-fi really yeah. guitar, but then you kind of, boom, boom. Like, do yeah. you remember if that was like, if you played it live then or if you're just messing around the studio? Sometimes it's like, oh, that sounds good and you did it by accident. Do you remember wh how that decision got made to kind of kick off the song in the studio? <clears throat> um, I think, you know, I was listening to a ton of, uh, free at that time, which was a uh, pre bad company band. Um, and mm -hmm. the, the bass player in that band, Andy Frazier, I was like really listening to a lot of Andy Frazier at that time. And then I was playing fretless on, I played fretless on most of the, most of the 10 records. So um, it's kind of an Andy Frazier move. And I think okay. I, I think it, it wasn't, I don't think I was thinking about it too much when I did it. And then it, it sort of stuck as like, um, you know, sounds cool. So okay, good deal. I got tons <laughs> more on this, but that, maybe maybe another time. I got a music pot. I might uh, might be there. Yeah, and do it yeah. And let's chase do it. it down because we can we can yeah. do that forever. Um, yeah. okay. Uh, let's pick the brackets. But before we do, a, a kind of a heads up for our audience. So this, I did something eight years ago, and it went over gangbusters. I got the favorite band or musical artist of every head coach in the men's NCAA tournament, and I'm bringing it back. And as it would so happen. <laughs> Uh, I did get some Pearl Jam responses. And not only that, I got the, I got these before I knew I'd be talking to Jeff. So in the tournament, Dan Hurley of UConn gave me Pearl Jam as his favorite band. Mark Byington, head coach at James Madison, which is actually a good 12 over wow. five candidate in the South. He gave me Pearl Jam. And then I got two more from coaches that did not make the field. Uh, Richmond's coached by Chris Mooney. Uh, they were the one seed in the A-10. They got knocked out, but he did give me Pearl Jam. And then a team that I thought was going to get in, the number one seed in this league, Mitch Henderson of Princeton. Right. Uh, he also gave me <clears throat> Pearl Jam. So four wow. picks. But this is a thing, by the way, that I've been meaning to write for years and I've never gotten to it. Uh, Hopkins, obviously, huge Pearl Jam fan. Chris Caputo, who's the who's the coach at George Washington. Uh, I'm him and and Rob Senderoff, who almost made the tournament. He is literally like flown yeah. to Italy to watch you guys wow. uh, watch you guys play. Massive, massive, massive Pearl Jam fans. In fact, Senderoff, he listens. To, oh, he's got. Lyrics from present tense in the team locker room and in the facilities. Wow. And I think he might, he listens, I think he listens to present tense or he listens to another Pearl Jam song literally every time before <laughs> he coaches a game. So the point is, uh, there's this thing about sports writers and loving Bruce Springsteen and all this kind of stuff. That's true. There's a lot, I mean, a lot of Pearl Jam fans in men's college I, basketball. I, 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 I'm, I, awesome. I'm a little disappointed Danny Sprinkle didn't pick 
Pearl Jam. Ooh, you want to know who? I'll tell you who Sprinkle gave me because I can even give him some grief Man. after this. Sprinkle gave me. Oh, you know who he gave? Me? He gave me Prince. I think you'll respect. Uh, okay, okay. Losing out to Prince. Okay, okay I'm, but I'm he did not. He, Danny Sprinkle did not give I me. About, I was about ready to cross Utah State off my. Bracket. Though, hey, by <laughs> by all me by all means, Matt Logie, who coaches Montana State, he get, he was like, I want to give you Justin Timberlake because he lives in Bozeman, but oh, I'm, it's, not, it's not my actual. It's not my actual favorite. <laughs> Justin Logie. Timber. Justin Timberlake is not a Montanan. Let, <laughs> Let, 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 let's get on the phone with Logie and get that shit straightened out right now because that, I mean, he lives in Big Sky too. That's not even Montana. That's like California. Uh, this is, this is, this is why I wanted to do the show right here. Some real, some real Montana smack talk. Logie gave me Chris Stapleton. So that was his, that was his actual Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, without, without a doubt. So with that in mind, there's plenty of Pearl Jam college basketball connections and I may well wind up writing about that one day. Uh, indeed. Okay. Let's get to your. Let's get to your picks. I uh, I want we'll go east, west, south, midwest. We're not going to pick through every game. I'm sure Jeff would love okay. to do that, but I'm not going to do that. Let's let's just say who you've got coming out of to the elite eight and then to the final four. So top half of the bracket in the east, we've got UConn is the one, yeah. Iowa State's the two, Illinois is the three, Auburn is the four, San Diego State is the five. Who do you got in the top half of that elite eight, and who you got well, on the bottom? Well, I, I had um, I had FAU beating. Uh, UConn in the second round, but now that I've heard that, oh, uh, that 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 uh, Dan Hurley, that, that that Coach Hurley like picked us as one of his bands. I, I I have to. Well, also like I'm I'm really good friends with Jimmy Mora, um, his brother his brother Mike, um, Jimmy, who's the coach at for the UConn football team. Yeah. Um, but uh, oh, so no. I'll, look at this. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take UConn to go all the way. Um, okay. To the final of the East against Iowa State, and that's going to be tough, man. Iowa State is like Iowa State is good, um, and I really, I really like San Diego State in in that, um, you know, in the mix okay. of that. Um, okay, so you gone um, over um, San Diego State to get to the lead eight, and then you got yeah. who Iowa State beating who Illinois, BYU. Who do you got and beating in that? Uh, 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 I'm going to go BYU just because they're kind of west. And I'm, I, ju- I just went through Salt Lake City today, so. Okay, I was wondering if you might pick the the folks from the Palouse to maybe get to that Elite Eight, but uh, but 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 no love for Pullman there, huh? I mean, it's not, it's yeah, not Montana. I'm a, I'm Don't a, get me I'm wrong, a, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a I'm a husky I'm a husky guy. So okay, so there we go. So no, just yeah, again for the folks that might not be aware of it. Okay, so you've got you've got UConn, Iowa State, and then uh, you have the Huskies or the Cyclones making the Final Four out of the East. Um. I'm gonna. I I I think I got to go Huskies now. I would have. I, I, I like uh, but if, ten if, minutes ago. I would have gone the. I would have said the other way. Wow! Look at this. I can't wait to tell her. I can't wait to tell Hurley about this. By the way. All right. Let's go down to the bottom with the West. Uh, the one is North Carolina. The two is Arizona. Three is Baylor. Four is Alabama. Five is Saint Mary's. Um, this is viewed by some as the weakest region. It might be the most. Uh, the region that might be most up for grabs. But who do you have facing off in the Elite Eight of the West? region jeff ain't it well i think i gotta go I, I, the other guys coach Izzo. i've met i've met coach Izzo a couple times we played in that gym uh when we played breslin uh, in, yeah. in lansing um yeah um but man how do you go against north carolina uh, well, new, I, Mex- new Mexico. I like New Mexico too. That, that, that they they could be a spoiler in the bottom part of that. That is correct. They are. I know you agree with me, Jeff. Wildly underseated. It's offensive. The committee didn't know what it was doing. Well, I was just shocked that I saw their eleven. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go uh, New Mexico okay. against North Carolina. I like it. Okay, and uh, <laughs> and I like St. Mary's too. I mean, I'm like I said, a West Coast bias is a. I know it's, t- it's tough. All right, so Tar Heels or Lobos to the Final Four? I'm going to go Lobos just because I hate the ACC. <sighs> Look at that. Richard Pitino, by the way, we share the same favorite band, Dave Matthews Band. No shame here. So there we go. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shouts to Stefan Lassard while we do this. Yes, absolutely. No <laughs> doubt about it. Um, let's, go, let's go Midwest here. Uh, Purdue is your one. Tennessee is your two. Creighton is your three. Kansas is your four. And Gonzaga is your five. Hope my Pacific Northwest Gonzaga was close enough for you, Jeff. Um, who's making it's, it to the? It's it, it's tough to go for the Zags, man. They had that's a tough that's a it tough, is. that's a tough bracket for them to get through. Um, I'm gonna pick. Um, 
I'm going to pick Utah State to come out of the top Ooh. of that. I'm going to get even after, gonna, even after Sprinkle didn't go with you. Okay, I respect yeah. it. I'm just assuming that we're number two. So I'm. <laughs> um, and then in the bottom part of the bracket, um, I'm going to go Creighton. I, I really, I really like Creighton. I think you've got a you've got a real chance here. As of tonight, deep into the night of selection Sunday, I've got the Jays in the Elite Eight. But I may I may switch that up and put them to the Final Four. They were they were a play away from getting there last season, and uh, they got a they got a real shot. Okay, so who who's breaking through to the final? Uh, who's going to Phoenix? I'm going to say the Jays. Creighton Jays. You ever played you ever played the CHI Health Center? Uh, no. Um, but I've 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 hooped a few times with Kyle Korver, so have you really? Okay, that's, that's kind of the same. <laughs> what's what's the best you've ever played against an NBA player, and who was it? Names the you have best to name that names. I've ever yes. the best that I've ever played. I don't need, I don't know if I've I don't know if I can remember the best. I can I can remember sort of holding my own a couple of times going up and playing with the Sonics. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I, I, I knew right away the first time. First time I played against an NBA guy, like I was guarding Mitch Richmond in the Rock and Jock MTV Rock and Jock game, and he and he gave me just like a quick twitch head fake, <laughs> and I was like a kid. I was like twenty seven. I was like prime. I was in my prime, yeah. and it was like very clear to me why <laughs> I never made the NBA. <laughs> uh, that's okay. He couldn't play. He couldn't play the opening lick to Jeremy. So you know. right. there you go. Um. Okay, so J so right now you got uh, Yukon, you've got the Lobos of New Mexico, you got the Jays, and we'll go up to the top right quadrant here. The South region, Houston is your one, Marquette is your two, Kentucky is your three. I have to believe you played Rupp Arena. I mean, everyone's played Rupp Arena. You've played Rupp yep. Arena for sure, yep. right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, amazing. Duke is your four, and Wisconsin is your five. Who's going to the Elite Eight in the South? Um, I'm going. Uh, I'm going Houston. Cause man, that team is that team is fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Like they're that's like an NBA team, like long guards, like. Um, and I'm gonna go Marquette. Okay. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna. Um, my best friend is a Wisconsin guy, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go with Marquette, even though I think that's gonna be a tough slog. It, it very well may be, but uh, but as long as Tyler Kolick is healthy and, and can give it a go, Marquette's got a got a healthy chance there. That is your only chalk, I believe, for the uh, for the regional final of, uh, of the four spots in the bracket. So Houston versus Marquette, Kelvin Sampson, who has recently taken Houston to a Final Four. Shaka yeah. Smart hasn't uh, hasn't gotten back past the first weekend since he actually went to the Final Four in 2011 with uh, with VCU. Uh, Marquette most recently made a Final Four. In 2003, which was the year after Riot Act came out, I can tie a Pearl Jam link into anything we talk about here, Jeff. Don't you worry about it. Um, Incredible. Uh, Houston versus Marquette in the Elite Eight. Who's going to go to Phoenix? Um, I'm going to pick Houston. I think I, th I think Houston wins it all. I, I think. Oh, okay. Here we go. You think Houston's Houston's going to win it all? Now I, I will let you know. Being a, not just a college hoops reporter, but a but a data nerd when it comes to this stuff, Houston has rated actually as the best team in the sport, not just the AP rankings, but actually like the computer metrics for yeah. about eighty five percent of the season. UConn just took them over a couple of days ago, but Houston yeah. has rated as the best team in the sport, so it is a very logical pick. So you've got your final four is UConn against New Mexico, Houston against Creighton. That's two teams out of the Big East, Houston out of the Big Twelve, New Mexico shouts to the Mountain West. Absolutely. So you said you've got Houston winning it all. I, I, I think I, I think I have to switch it now. Now that again, now, now why? That, now that Coach Hurley has picked us, I got to pick him. Oh, wow! I got to uh, pick well, UConn over Houston. <laughs> I do not. I do not lie to you, Jeff. Amen. Right now, and, and I will not change my title game pick. UConn Houston. Wow! Look UConn, at that, Houston. Wow! You, we got the same. Look at this. Look at us right now. The same championship <laughs> game. UConn over Houston. They have been the two best teams in the country. Couple of one seeds, opposite sides of the bracket. Uh, different, great teams, but for different reasons. And yeah, I mean, it should just be a fantastic tournament. Is uh, you, you know, big basketball guy. I'm curious. Is is the NCAA tournament your favorite sporting event, or you get just as into the playoffs, or the NBA finals? Where does where does March Madness kind of land for you as a sports fan? No, the first the first weekend of the NCAA tournament is the best. That I mean, I, I had a uh, it, I haven't done it since before the pandemic, but. Every year that I had off, 
I, we would go, there was a group of four or five of us that we would meet somewhere. And usually we would have a tie with, you know, Cro coach Chris Groviak or coach Tinkle yeah. or, or somebody, but um, or Mon Montana made it a bunch, you know, in the last 15 years. So, you, you know, you really try to catch all those games. Um, but that's the, that's the best thing ever to go somewhere and watch four games in a day. It's just the best thing. So, um, that's crazy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to do it. I'm gonna try to do it Thursday. I'm gonna try to get, get up there. So at least, so highly confident. At least get there to Spokane for yep. the Thursday four first round games, and uh, and kind of make it happen. That's that's wonderful stuff, man. I appreciate you uh, you taking time, spending some time. Again, Dark Matter is the Pearl Jam album. It's mm -hmm. gonna come out on April nineteenth, twenty twenty four. Of course. So we are just a month away, and you'll be hearing Pearl Jam with some uh, with some CBS promos and all this stuff. This was wonderful. Thank you for just Thanks, giving man. me some time. Yeah. Talking, talking some hoops, talking some music. And uh, yeah, any, you know, I, and having talked to some of these college basketball coaches that know you, like, like Larry and Wayne, um, we've had conversations about you, like going back a few years. And they're like, no, no, no. Uh, guy loves his basketball and like loves to play. And he, he's a real one when it comes to that. So it was, uh, it was awesome getting to chat hoops with you. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. Congrats. Get that thank you so off. much, Jeff. Sleep. You can check out Pearl Jam, Dark Matter on April 19th. Everyone watching, thank you for subscribing to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We will have more, a lot more NCAA tournament preview episodes coming Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, reaction all throughout the tournament uh, every day of the week. And we'll talk to you again real soon.